for today, given the topics, I would focus on my 2016 book, The Secret of Our Success. So what I'm going to do is draw out some ideas from that. I'll, I'll occasionally elaborate with some more recent findings since 2016 to try to update things a little bit. Uh, at the end, I'm happy to take questions. I see there are already some questions. Uh, so it looks like you know, we'll have a good discussion. All right, so I like to start with this puzzle. And the puzzle I took up in The Secret of Our Success was how humans became such an uh, ecologically dominant species. So if you look at the modern world and you take all the humans and our domesticated animals, our food preference, uh, we compose over 98% of the terrestrial vertebrate biomass. So that's an incredible uh, statement about our ecological dominance. But I think to really get at that problem, you have to go back before the age of industrial technology in the first cities and even the origins of agriculture, back to a time when humans first expanded out of Africa and began to enter an immense diversity of environments. So sometime after 100,000 years ago, humans expand out of Africa, before, or sometime after 60,000 years ago, we arrive probably via some skin boats in Australia and enter the deserts there. Uh, after 50,000 into Europe, uh, after 40,000 into the Arctic, and then out to island Melanesia, and after 20,000 into the New World and all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. So spanning from the malarial swamps of New Guinea to the frozen tundra of the Arctic and the arid deserts of Australia. An immense diversity of environments. So part of the question is, is how did we manage to survive and enter all of these different environments? Well, the first idea is that we didn't do it the way so many other species do it. So Darwin famously studied the finches and the finches had specializations to adapt to diverse niches. And these are genetically evolved specializations that led to differences in beak length. So humans are a relatively genetically homogeneous species and we don't have very many uh, genetic specializations or adaptations. So the question is, is how did we do it? If we look at another ecologically dominant species, so our competitor for ecological dominance is the, is the ant, but the ants did it the old fashioned way. So they speciated into over 40, uh, 14,000 different species and have immense range of different specialization for different kinds of environments. They control a similar amount of biomass as us. The, the power of our uh, capacity to adapt to diverse environments non-genetically was highlighted in this recent paper in Science uh, by Barbasai, Lucas, and Pondorfer. And what, what these authors did was they compiled evidence from over 300 uh, ethnographically and historically known hunter-gatherers, and then looked at the animal and bird species that were near where those hunter-gatherers lived, and then picked 15 different behaviors. So we have foraging behaviors, including the percentage of different things in the diet, uh, reproductive behaviors like the age of first reproduction or polygyny, and social behaviors like paternal care. And what they find is that there's a, often a correlation between what we see in the non-human species in, in and around where the hunter-gatherers live and the hunter-gatherer behaviors, as if there's some broad set of ecological um, uh, selection pressures or constraints that's favoring certain behavioral patterns. So just on their little, uh, their first figure one here, uh, you can go from, you can look at food storage and go from very little food storage, so African hunter-gatherers, uh, Congo Basin foragers, all the way up to groups that store a lot, other, other foragers who store a lot. And you see the same thing with mammals who store food. food. Of course, crucially, when we look at how humans actually do this, it's, it relies on a large body of cultural knowledge. So humans use techniques of fermentation, they smoke, they salt, they cure, and other techniques for doing storage that somebody who just arrived there wouldn't know. So we seem to have a system for adapting to diverse environments that's non-genetic. So the question is, how did we do it? So a, a typical explanation is that we have big brains and we can individually solve problems. And, and that's, that will be the secret of our success. I'm gonna suggest a little bit different view, but in order to sharpen our thinking about this, I first wanna dip into this uh, set of cases that Rob Boyd and I have been compiling for years of lost European explorers. So uh, these are cases in which you had some group of uh, European or sometimes American explorers that found themselves trapped in or marooned in some environment where hunter-gatherers have, have been living for at least centuries and usually millennia or longer. And the question is, can they survive? 
do they have a kind of brain that can just play a different jukebox program and adapt to that environment and figure out how to find food? Or is there some other process for, that, that allows them to adapt or doesn't allow them to adapt in this case? So one of my favorite examples is the case of Birkenwills. So if, if you're from Australia, you would have heard of this. So this is a public-private partnership in 1860 that left from the city of Melbourne uh, to explore the interior of the continent and go all the way to the Gulf of Carpentaria for the possibility of a telegraph cable coming across the continent. And then the, the idea was to come back. It's a little bit of a complex story, but I'm going to kind of shorten it here for you. The group broke down into two uh, different parts, and one group of four men left from Cooper's Creek, right about here. And they headed up, they had 12 weeks of food. They'd specially imported camels from India, so it was a well funded expedition, lots of supplies. Now, at, they had trouble, and after eight weeks, they were running out of food uh, and they smelt salt air. They declared victory, they were near the Gulf, and they decided to turn back. Things went even worse got worse. They were having trouble finding food. They were starving. They had to eat some of their pack animals. Some of their camels escaped, although they did retain some. They began to fall behind, but after being several months late, they finally dragged back into Cooper's Creek. The resupply party, which, was come, which had come up behind them, had waited so long, was running out of food themselves, and left the, the morning before they arrived. So it's a sort of a tragic story you can't make up. So they had to decide what to do. So uh, Burke decided instead of trying to catch the party, they were tired and they needed to rest. There were some supplies there they could use. They eventually decided to follow the creek uh, westward to a ranch and a mountain, which was prophetically named Mount Hopeless. So they began heading down Cooper's Creek towards Mount Hopeless. Their last camel dies, which led them to be trapped along Cooper's Creek because there was a stretch of open desert and without camels to transport water, they didn't think they could cross the open stretch of desert. They didn't know how to find water, for example. So uh, things looked bad at first, but then they began to contact the local Aboriginal populations. They would get some occasional gifts of fish. And they, in one of the camps, they saw the women processing this sporocarp called nardu. They thought it was a seed. It took them a while, but they eventually found the nardu. And they began making gruel and bread. And it looked like they were going to be OK, like they could survive for a while until the rescue party arrived. But what they didn't notice is that the Aboriginal women treated the sporocarp. So there were two processes. One was to grind, leach, heat it, and then only eat it with a mussel shell, or grind it, leach it, and bake it in ash. These are detoxification processes because Nardo uh, has something called thiamines in it, which depletes the B1 in your body and eventually gives you a horrible disease called beriberi. So Burke and Wills sort of starved to death on an empty stomach because they couldn't process the Nardo and they were poisoning themselves. The third member of their party ended up stumbling out into the desert and eventually got rescued by the Aboriginal, fed and was, was healthy by the time the rescue party arrived from Melbourne. So that's part of the reason we know the story. We also have uh, Wills journals. So uh, these are, this is a group of lost European explorers who couldn't survive in a place where humans have been surviving as foragers for 60,000 years. And the story makes clear that what they didn't know was all the things about how to catch food, detoxify food, make tools to, uh, to, to capture animals, and that kind of thing. So they couldn't figure out how to survive. And it wasn't just that they had bad luck. There was literally hundreds of other foods they could have poisoned themselves on in Australia. So one is the Morton Bay chestnut. It wasn't just the nardu. And they didn't think of using spiniflex. So this um, unsuspecting looking bush is actually has a, has a crystal on the leaves, which when mixed with certain kinds of dung and heated is a powerful adhesive that can be used to make tools. But unless you know that, it's hard to figure out. So Burke and Wills couldn't survive. Any adolescent who had grown up there among the Aboriginal populations could have found the water to cross the open desert, could have processed the Nardu and done all the ba basic things to survive. So this suggests that, uh, you know, th that they were just lacking this large body of knowledge. Now you might think surviving in the Australian outback is too challenging. Maybe I've given them too hard of a problem. But remember I mentioned those camels that escaped. Well, it turns out the camels escaped and bred with uh, their fellow camels and eventually made lots more camels. And so the Australian desert is now loaded with feral camels that had survived the lost European explorer challenge. 
And that's because they have lots of specific adaptations that allow them to survive. They can smell water within a mile away. They have powerful detoxification processes as part of the digestive systems that humans lack. And this allowed camels to survive. Humans have to rely on cultural knowledge for these things. So a good question is why do we have to do it, but not the camels? All right, so that gives us one sense that, that we're, when placed in, a, in an environment where we know hunter-gatherers can survive, we can't do it. We don't have the know-how. We can't figure out how to make the tools or, or the food uh, to survive. Another angle at this kind of problem, asking the question as to what the secret of our success is, how we've been able to become this ecologically dominant species, is uh, this is work by Esther Herman and Mike Tomasella at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. And what these researchers did is they had a kind of face-off, a competition between three different ape species. So two and a half year old children, I've, I've placed my son Josh in here as a representative two-year-old, they're actually German children, a uh, large population of chimps, so over hundred chimp subjects, and then some orangutans. And they gave them a battery of 18 cognitive tests, tests about space, about quantities, causality, and social learning. And this is just the percentage correct for each of our ape species. You can see humans and chimpanzees are often indistinguishable. Uh, in some cases, the chimps are edging them out. You know, it's within the margin of error, but the chimps do actually have higher scores. Uh, the orangs do a little worse, but not tremendously worse. They're still kind of you know, in play here. The only, this, the only uh, domain where the children really clean up are, is in copying, in uh, social learning. So this really captures the idea that Mike Tomasello has been pointing out for years that compared to other apes, humans are imitation machines, powerful imitators compared to fairly low level social learning among the, among the apes. Interestingly, tool use, humans are often portrayed as big tool users. In the tool using task, the chimps beat the two and a half year old children. So they were better innate tool users in some sense than the children. Now, one thing that's interesting about this is you might not like the experiment for potentially lots of reasons, but one reason is, is that it pits children against apes of a variety of ages. And we know that if we were to test 18 or 20 or 30 or uh, pick any adult age human, they would blow the roof off the test. They'd bet, you know, people would be getting 100% on this. But the chin, with the apes, the, the non-human apes, they don't get better as they get older at the task. So something is happening to the humans that's making them cognitively more sophisticated and better at this task that we don't see when apes age. So part of the question is, is what's happening there? Before I get into that, I wanna just point out that this is not one experiment, but you can look at experiments on working member or strategic thinking. So think Machiavelli and kind of game theorist thinking, chimps actually are better at humans than that, at least in the experiments that have been done. So there seems to be, uh, this helps shapes our understanding of what the key elements of human cognition are that might explain this question. So one of the things I'm gonna be arguing, I just wanna kind of jump ahead to how, why it is the children get smarter and as adults, we can do so well in these cognitive tasks is that culture provides us a large body of pre-built solutions to tasks. So things like springs and uh, screws and levers, we learn as our environments because they've already been invented. We get to play with them and see how they work and then we can use them to solve new problems. But each of these things on its own is hard to invent. But if it becomes part of a large cumulative body of evidence, you're getting an ever accumulating uh, pool of things to use to solve problems. One of the examples I like is the wheel, because we tend to think of the wheel as simple. So Gary Larson, who used to write this cartoon called The Far Side, he would show Neanderthals experimenting with uh, wheels back in the Paleolithic, and they were usually making co comical mistakes. But the idea that they were even experimenting with wheels gives us a sense that wheels are easy to figure out. Turns out wheels are hard to figure out. So only invented in Eurasia, so never invented in the Americas, except for some, some toys, uh, never invented in Australia, Oceania, um, other places. And in Eurasia, not invented until about 6,000 years ago, used in pottery and then eventually for carts and not, not for a while for other things. Uh, Elastically stored energy of the kind of used in bows and arrows, never invented in Australia. New Guineans invented bows and arrows, but never fletching. Uh, so these things are hard to invent. And of course, there's lots of mental tools. So we can all, as a consequence of speaking English, uh, count without bounds. But lots of societies that have been studied by anthropologists count one, two, three, many. So the Machiganga, who I studied uh, for a bit, uh, count one, two, three, many. And this particular group counts to 27. And it's always based on some kind of digit, digit system. Something like the placeholder zero was only invented twice in human history, once by the Maya and once in India. 
and it spreads from India uh, after uh, Islamic powers copy cent uh, conquer Central Asia, it spreads into uh, the Islamic world, eventually into Spain, and then eventually Europeans reluctantly adopt it. And now, of course, globally, the Arabic numbers are the standard. Okay, and there's an accumulating set of concepts we can use to solve problems. Okay, so the argument that is not our intelligence, here meaning intelligence is the ability to solve problems on one's own, but rather I'm making the case that it's our capacity for cumulative cultural evolution, that there's something about the way we learn over generations that builds up an accumulating body of adaptive know-how, practices, customs that help us adapt to diverse environments and solve all kinds of problems increasingly complex technology. Now, as part of this, once you assume it's social learning that's doing the driving here, there's straightforward prediction that larger and more interconnected populations can generate larger and more complex repertoires of tools and technologies and know-how, all kinds of aspects of culture and some of which I'll be talking about. Now, theoretically, you can actually be too interconnected, but as a practical matter, I don't think that's happened very often in human history. So we can just look at one side of the parabola. Um, so key to this is high fidelity cultural transmission. Lots of different aspects of cognition can contribute to this potentially, but anything that leads for higher fidelity cultural transmission will contribute and greater sociality. So larger, more interconnected populations can generate more of this fancy technology. And then finally, I'll make the case that the key to understanding the unique nature of our species is in the fact that much of our genetic evolution has been driven by cultural products fire and cooking, uh, tools are some of the examples I give, but, but there's lots more. Merely the presence and the importance of cultural information is a big factor in our genetic evolution. All right, so this is an important uh, uh, intellectual contribution. And I, I think that, I mean, the seminal contribution here, and I, I'm looking at Pete right now, uh, comes in from Boyd and Richardson's 1985 book where they began to dissolve this dichotomy between genetic evolutionary explanations based on natural selection on one side and cultural explanations on the other. I should, I should nod to the fact that Mark Feldman and, and Luca Luigi Coali Sforza also have a 1976 paper, which, which has this insight. Uh, instead, they say, let's apply the logic of natural selection to thinking about culture. And so this epistemologically, this makes cultural explanations, a kind of genetic evolutionary explanation. It inserts cultural explanations under the Darwinian umbrella. And this is really quite a revolutionary idea. So now we can think about the evolution of our capacities for learning from others and from learning more generally, including the forms of individual learning, and think about how that then shapes cultural and, uh, culture and cultural evolution. And that then, of course, can feed back on our genetic evolution. So that changes everything. I now, digging in a little bit deeper, we can ask questions like, how has natural selection shaped our cognition to best exploit the socially available information? So here we're using the logic of natural selection. We have almost over 40 years of models showing how this could happen, uh, might have shaped our mind. So one of my favorite things to think about is how it would affect who we pay attention to. So how we select the individuals in our social milieu to learn from. And I'm going to say more about that in a second. Uh, also very important is content-based mechanisms. So uh, there are certainly some things in the world and some inferences we need to make that are important. So it's clear that people pay particular attention to food. Uh, Dan Fessler and others have argued that during a certain period of childhood, we attend to fire, obviously important for learning in human evolutionary history. And we think about artifacts different than we think about other kinds. So there's potentially some evolved cognition for, for learning about this. Living kinds, we attend to certain kinds of information. So Clark Barrett, James Broch have worked on this. We seem to recognize social norms in the world and have particular ways of thinking about social groups. So all this can, can provide content-based mechanisms to shape how we learn things. A little bit more on model-based selection. So here you're, we're trying to use cues of the people we might learn from who might potentiate fitness adaptive information. So there's, there's both theory and evidence suggesting why we might attend to more skilled individuals or more competent individuals attend to success. So you might think of the first one skill as how accurate your arrows are. And you might think, think of success as how much big prey you bring back or what your caloric return is on average. Prestige is who other people think you, that you should pay attention to. So you can observe the behavior of others and their behavior will cue you in on who they think is worthy of attention and, and learning from. 
uh, age. Age is a good cue. Not everybody gets to be old, especially in smaller scale societies. Getting to be an elderly member of the community means you knew enough to get to be elderly, right? So there's a sieve as time goes by. Uh, and of course, older children know more than younger children and can provide suitable information. And of course, there can be self-similarity biases. So you want to acquire the stuff that's suitable for you and your likely role later in life. So using cues like sex, ethnicity, dialect can help you cue in on what you might need to know. Many of you are familiar, there's quite a large body of evidence uh, for this. Uh, so there's clear evidence that humans acquire food preferences. Uh, numbers of children, things like realized fertility is clearly culturally inherited, um, mate choice, technological adoptions, the meaning of words, dialect, pronunciation, economic strategy, suicide is even copied and transmitted, uh, beliefs, things like whether you believe in germs or angels, uh, and then there's all kinds of cognitive strategies, so things like the kind of biases you use in judgment. The content of reputations is culturally transmitted, and social motivation, so the things you might measure in a behavioral game, Things like fairness and punishment experiments showing that those are culturally transmitted. So a vast body of evidence. These, seem to, these capacities for cultural learning seem to be, uh, they develop reliably, early, automatically, and are often unconscious. So they have the basic hallmarks of an adaptation. In this sense, they're nothing like reading. All right, so this is capable of producing cultural adaptations. So genetic evolution uh, shapes our psychological capacities for cultural learning. And, uh, and then this gives rise to the cultural products, which are the adaptations. Now, one of the cases I've tried to make is that, uh, that this can all happen outside of conscious awareness. And some of the most interesting and important features of our, uh, of our cultural repertoires that allow us to adapt to diverse environments arise either entirely or at least partially outside of our conscious awareness. No causal understanding of, the op of what's operating underneath is required, although it can certainly help in some cases, although we'll see that it can also hurt. So causal understanding is tricky. And um, yeah, so sometimes having a causal understanding might actually hurt the adaptation. One example I use in the book is the spices. So Paul Sherman and Jennifer Billing make the case that uh, spices are unusual and it should puzzle us as to why humans use them because mostly they're chemical adaptations that keep critters away and often critters like us, so other mammals. But the patterns that they see in the use of spices suggest that spices are a cultural adaptation for uh, killing or getting rid of the pathogens in meat. And they, it's, they seem to be used more commonly in hot climates. The more powerful spices are used in combination with other spices to have maximum killing power in, in, in hot places, for example. We're, we're, even, we're even able to overcome innate aversion. So something like chili peppers, which is a common spice used in, in the new world, in new world cuisine, uh, seems to be innately aversive. Babies won't eat it, don't like it. Chimpanzees don't like it. Um, other birds actually do like it. So these, they may be adapted to, to get birds to feed on it. All right, and there's other examples for the purposes of time here. I'm not gonna, I, I love these and I could, I could love to talk about each one, uh, but something like the use of ash or corn in, uh, uh, sorry, the use of an alkali in corn such as ash releases the otherwise unavailable niacin and makes corn a viable staple where it wouldn't otherwise be. Uh, people themselves, and I've, I've talked to people who use this process, they don't understand that they won't tell you, you got to do that, otherwise you'll get uh, pellagra, which is a horrible condition if you don't have enough niacin. Um, I wrote about this in the book a bit. And then finally, I'll mention this new research uh, by Jay Karras, Brian Wood, and Rob Boyd, uh, where they interviewed Hadza hunters about their bows. And Hadza seem to know about the causal, they seem to have a causal understanding or causal intuitions that are accurate about things they could learn from experience. But other aspects of bow design it's clear that they don't have a complete causal model. So the Hadza bow embodies engineering aspects which are well adapted, which the Hadza themselves don't understand. It's the point of, the, of their paper. Uh, and so this is, this is important because the bow has been used for tens of thousands of years by hunter-gatherers. And if we take the Hadza as, you know, they use it for the same kind of thing, they don't seem to have a causal understanding that allows us to explain the engineering in the bow, then it means this may be a deep and important part of human evolution. Okay, so I just want to set this in a little bit of a uh, bigger framework. I'm not going to spend too much time about this, but people may want to ask questions. So the basic picture here is that we have genetic evolution shaping our capacities for cultural learning and lots of other interesting features of, of human cognition. 
This then gives rise to cultural evolution, which produces complex tools and rituals, lots of customs and practices, social norms and institutions, which I'm not saying much about, but, but I'm happy to talk about after, uh, in languages. And then onto genetically and over cultural evolutionary time, we have to adapt our brains uh, to this culturally constructed world. All right, and there's now quite a bit of evidence, and Sergey mentioned my new book, The Weirdest People in the World. The key point I make in that book is there's lots of variation psychologically that's non-genetic, but as a consequence of people growing up in worlds with different institutions and social norms, different languages and different tools. And it affects very basic aspects of cognition like visual processing, conformity, how we deal with numbers, pro-social motivations, and even spatial cognition. So it's, you have to, we have to think of our psychology as evolving culturally as, as well as genetically. All right, and then of course there's feedback on genetic evolution. Okay, just to give you a little bit of a sense of some of these culturally evolved cognitive adaptations, uh, the way to think about this is culture is devising ways to shape our thinking, shape our, our, our mental abilities to figure out new ways to solve problems. So something as simple as uh, right and left. Some languages don't have right and left and, and people are bad at distinguishing it. If you watch children, it actually takes children a while to learn their right from their left. But once you can do it, it allows you to solve new kinds of problems. Uh, one of the tricky parts of, of English orthography is that letters uh, are certain letters are tough to learn because like so uh, lowercase b and lowercase d are mirror invariant lateral they have lateral mirror invariants which means they're hard to learn but once you can do that then you can you can add extra letters to your alphabet uh, one of my favorite examples is the mental abacus so as you may know the abacus has evolved over thousands of years and it's it's organized in a way that fits our mind so it clumps numbers into small groups that are easy to remember it organizes them in space so it takes advantage of our visual spatial abilities but what what can, one can do, and this is common in places like India, is children can train on the abacus and then put the abacus aside. And they can make extraordinary calculations, adding long lists of numbers, multiplying large numbers, and beat people using calculators, just using their mental abilities. Except if you watch them, they're, they're, they're visualizing the abacus and they're moving their fingers around while they're making the calculation. So they've built a new cognitive tool that allows them to do things that would seem extraordinary. Okay, so that's a, just a little bit on uh, the creation of new cognitive abilities. Finally, I want to make this point because it's an old point within those of us who are interested in evolution and human behavior. So it's a common claim going back decades that natural selection is the only known causal process capable of producing complex functional organic mechanisms. So I'm citing my esteemed colleagues, David Buss, Marty Hazelton, and Todd Shackelford, but I could very easily have cited uh, professors Pinker and Bloom, or uh, Richard Dawkins or something like that. So this is a common thought. And I guess I just don't agree. Uh, cultural evolution has moved this aside. There's now another process capable of building stuff without any conscious intervention, uh, complex functionally integrated uh, adaptations. And so I've given you some examples here. All right, it's also worth reminding, and this goes back to the Boyd and Richardson 85 again, but natural selection can also act on cultural variation. And this was one of the neat things about Darwin is that it was independent of the inherited system. Okay, this is my example from the book. Uh, and it's important, I think, some people have the idea that you, know, you, can't, you couldn't have uh, something like a, a product in the world, something that you would build that could be genetically evolved. But here we have the village weaver. And the village weaver builds this cool nest that embodies a number of different engineering, uh, uh, engineering principles. So it can fall out of a tree. It's got this underneath entry point. Um, it's hard, so other predators can't get through it. So there's a lot of cool parts to it. Uh, it uses three different basic knots. A village weaver can do this, never has to see another village weaver. You know, just innate, right? So it's, it's, it's built into the genes that the bird can figure out how to do this. So presumably the bird doesn't understand the engineering principles, but yet there it is. Uh, now, this uh, Inuit snow house is also embodies a number of cool engineering principles. There's lots of thermodynamics here. There's clever things like rendering seal oil to make heat, to heat it, and using this for a window. Um, this long tunnel entrance helps it with heat. And uh, there's no reason to suspect that the makers of this understand all the engineering principles, but yet it evolved and it works and it provides a way for people to survive in the high Arctic. 
constructed by cultural evolution over long periods of time, constructed by genetic evolution. Okay, so now uh, that gives you a sense of culture and cultural adaptation. I'll just um, move on to the collective brain. So if humans are heavily reliant on learning from others, and we can create this cumulative process, it follows, at least in, in mathematical models, that um, uh, larger and more interconnected populations should produce more complex uh, products, more complex technological products. So there's a number of different studies like this now. Uh, my favorite is this one by Michelle Klein and Rob Boyd. And what these researchers did is they got, gathered data from the earliest ethnographic data we have from different islands in Oceania. And you can get a measure from this ethnography of the early population, the kind of at contact, European contact population sizes. And then uh, there's supp a good supply of uh, information on the marine foraging tools that these populations used. And they developed two different measures of complexity for the marine foraging tools to test the idea as to whether larger and more interconnected populations had fancier tools, more and fancier tools. So this is the results. Uh, larger populations here on a log scale, number of different marine foraging tools on the, on the vertical, and the strong relationships, so larger populations had more tools. Uh, same thing over here, they calculated the mean techno units per tool. It sounds fancy techno units, but it's actually the number of separate parts. So you can break down any technology into some number of parts, obviously a crude measure of complexity, but you see this strong relationship. So larger populations had tools with more parts, essentially. Now, it's not just the size of the population. It's also the interconnectedness. So they managed to extract measures of the amount of contact that these islands had. The islands provide a real advantage because on the continent, populations are blended together uh, sometimes. But uh, in the islands, at least you can, you can use the island as a discrete unit. And so islands that had high contact, according to the ethnography, tend to be above the regression line, and low contact tend to be below the regression line. So there seems to be an independent effect. And this fits the idea that the key number is the effective population size, which is some combination of the population plus interconnectedness. So you're, you're getting a little bit from other populations that are, that are on other islands. All right. Now, I think this is important uh, for our friends in paleoanthropology because uh, I still see, I still see my, my friends in paleoanthropology trying to make inferences about how smart ancestral species of humans are based on the complexity of their tools. And so here we have Hawaiians, uh, and I believe this is one of the islands, uh, Manus, off the coast of New Guinea. And, uh, you know, there's the Austronesian expansion, so there's no reason to think that there's big genetic differences between these populations, but yet these guys have fancier tools. And if you were just to have the archaeological data, suppose that all the tools preserved, you would think that these guys were smarter or in some innate sense, perhaps, uh, than these folks down here. But so much of our ability to produce complex tools depends on our sociality, uh, that you can't make any inferences about how smart a species is or a population is based on uh, their toolkit because of the importance of the interconnectedness of populations. If these guys had ended up on Hawaii, they would have made fancy tools as the inference. Okay, now uh, there's a number of different ways at this. So the, there's the kind of correlations that I've just shown you like Boyd and Klein provide. There's actually some causal evidence where you can use things like exogenous factors that affect immigration shock. So uh, we've been uh, looking at this evidence in the case of the US where the US gets an external shock from immigration and that raises the number of patents. That supports the, this cultural or this collective brain hypothesis as well and provides more causal inference power. But I think another valuable source of evidence on this idea comes from a large body now of experiments, laboratory experiments, where we, we try to test the idea in the lab using laboratory generations. Uh, so one of the later speakers in the series is Michael Muthu Krishnan. So this is work that he led um, a while ago. And, um, so in this experiment, we had uh, gen laboratory generations of undergraduates at the University of British Columbia. And we can see we had an in individual condition where subsequent generations could only learn from one previous member of the generation and a group condition where these, this individual could learn from everybody in the prior generation. And what they had to do was replicate this image using an image editing software that's notoriously user unfriendly. So it's hard to figure out. So replicate the image, they had a time limit they're paid for their own performance, so people are incentivized, and they're also paid for their performance of their students. 
And then they can access either the one model or the five models from the previous generation. Now, after the task, we let them write up up to two pages to pass down to their student. Remember, they're incentivized for their student to do well. So they can write down any tricks. All right, so they, and, and what the student gets is the product. So something that hopefully looks like this, but usually doesn't. Uh, the write up, the tips, and then the target. So they know where they're going. So it's like the best canoe maker die. You have his canoe. You've got to figure out how to make this canoe. Okay, so uh, 10 laboratory generations. The treatment where you can only learn from one person, you can see you don't get any better over 10 generations. When you can learn from anyone in the previous generation, it gets much better. So that by the 10th generation, these guys are something like three or four times better than these guys at making these images. So big difference, everybody's randomly assigned to treatment groups, no difference in intelligence, other cognitive abilities are, you know, we're sorting randomly, so they shouldn't matter. Uh, I show this experiment when I give talks, even though there's now a large collection of these done by people like Alex Masudi and uh, Max Durex and others, um, because you can actually see the data pretty clearly. So uh, here's the target. Uh, here are some of the responses from the one model group, and here's the five model group. And you can see actually the five model group did not do well in round one, which if you pop back here, you can see they're down here. The, the other, the one model group actually had a pretty good round one. So, that, you know, they did well relative speaking. You can see that here's them. Uh, and then these guys are floundering around, making a little up. This guy gets it, then all these guys get it. And then these guys are off to the races. Down here, they just keep flopping around and they just never get anywhere. So by the time you're down here, the, uh, the, the worst person in this place is better than the best person over here. That's how powerful this, this cumulative process is. The worst person better than the best person in the other group. Okay, now we wondered whether people were just copying the best person in the previous generation or whether they were somehow using the information across individuals. So this is when you could copy all five. So we broke down all of the elements of this into parts and then looked at whether uh, having a model who had that predicted you having that when you eventually produce your image. And what this evidence shows is that people clearly looked at the best person the most. So if they have it, you're four times more likely to have it in yours. Uh, but the second model mat mattered also two and a half times more likely. And the third model mattered, and even the fourth model mattered. But the fifth model, people ignored the worst person. So there is a, uh, some contribution here from, from all the models. And this is important because it allows you to create uh, innovation without invention. And what I mean by that is if I learn something from one person and I learn something else from another person and I put it together, I've made something new, but I didn't actually invent anything. I just did some work. I just did promiscuous copying. Okay, uh, so that, that, that illustrates the basic point, the power of the collective brain of sharing information, generating uh, fancier tools and technologies and practices. I'll just mention this one study led by Max Durex, uh, Alex Masudi, Rob Boyd, uh, um, one of these laboratory experiments. And I don't wanna go into detail on this. Uh, here's the, uh, oh, uh, uh, here's the uh, image. Um, and this device, so what subjects had to do was they had to figure out how to make this roll down this ramp at maximum speed. There's basically two easy, I mean, this is an undergraduate, engineer, an undergraduate engineering problem. You need to know about maximize angular momentum or minimize angular momentum and potential energy. You have to get the most potential energy. And so uh, what the authors did was they had each person practice for five or play for five rounds and then pass the information on to five other people. And this is the average speed. So you can see that there is getting some both individual learning and cumulative culture as it's passed down the generations until the fifth, the final round of the fifth participant is the best round. Uh, but they did two treatments. And in one treatment, they just let people pass down the positions of the weights on this thing. So you got to move these weights around. That's the key. Uh, and they, or, or you could pass the positions of the weights or you could pass the positions of the weights and give some strategy, some, some whatever your theory was about what you were trying to do with this thing. And what they found is that adding the theory added nothing. So the verbal transmission was useless and the, the transmission of causal models was useless. It was, it was just the passing of the information and the, and the individual experience with it. So it does show that you can produce uh, improved pieces of technology uh, without any causal understanding and that adding the opportunity for causal understanding doesn't necessarily make it better. Now, of course, there must be circumstances where it does, but it doesn't have to. Uh, OK. 
Okay, we're gonna skip that. All right, now I typically lay this out by present by um, uh, referring to technology, but um, you can apply this to any domain of culture. So I'm particularly interested in institutions uh, and that's much of what uh, The Weirdest People in the World is about, my, my new book. But you can also apply it to language. I saw there was a question in the chat on language. So you can think of the of words and grammatical rules as a toolkit for communicating and cumulative cultural evolution expands the size of this toolkit and improves it for the purposes of communication. So language is very much a product of cumulative cultural evolution. Now, of course, this can have gene culture co-evolutionary effects. And I mentioned, I, I suggest some of those in the book. Uh, one of the ways I try to convince uh, readers of this is that I look at nonverbal forms of communication. So for example, uh, various populations have sign languages that are independent of their spoken language. And it can, you can use it to communicate when you don't want to make sounds, like if you're hunting. Uh, some populations have whistle languages. So they can speak a full language through whistles that can sometimes transmit over distances. Uh, so, and each of these has a kind of feeling of local adaptation. So groups that want to use sign languages to communicate over long distances have big gesture sign languages. Uh, groups that want to use whistles to communicate across mountains have certain kinds of finger whistles as opposed to lip whistles, which other groups uh, like the Maya use. And so languages seem to be adapted to the ecological environments. They're not arbitrary, and there's increasing evidence to that. Um, so warmer climates have more sonorous languages. Now, this means if true, the same logic applies. And so in the book, I discuss evidence. Uh, there's more subsequent evidence since that larger speaker communities have more words. Uh, they have more phonemes, you got to control for things like distance from Africa, and they're more informationally efficient. In other words, the same utterance, uh, you can pack more information per, per volume utter of utterance. And these are the kinds of predictions you would get out of the collective brain, but applied to language instead of tools or instead of foraging equipment or something like that. Okay, uh, so bigger picture, moving on to the idea of gene culture co-evolution. So, at some point over the course of human evolutionary history, it was probably a gradual process, but the, the process of cultural learning, other apes have culture, they have social learning, but humans became cumulative, at least under certain conditions. So we might imagine initially that was a more rare event and then it gradually became more common. You get the interaction between these two inheritance systems. So cultural evolution begins producing things like tools. So something like Oldowan tools, uh, fire, cooking, tracking information, food processing, where to find underground roots and tubers, uh, how to make shelters and clothing. And then these things feed back. And they feed back and they're shaping our anatomy and our physiology. So my colleague Richard Rangham has argued for the centrality of fire and cooking, but it should not be forgotten that humans are terrible at making fires on their own. And cooking is something you have to learn how to do. It's easy to overcook things. There's all kinds of techniques. <clears throat> Transporting fire is a tricky business if you don't want to start it each time. So uh, this is a heavy dose of cultural learning here, but then fire and cooking shape our guts, um, shape our teeth, shape our uh, uh, digestive tracts. And also as, as the opportunity for, for larger brains. So in addition to producing the calories necessary for larger brains, we need the larger brains for acquiring this growing body of cultural information that's out there in the world. So once you begin to have cumulative cultural information, there's all this valuable stuff stored in the minds of others. You need a brain that's better able to acquire, store, and organize that newly available resource that's accumulating on this, on this uh, inheritance track. So this, this, create, this can create an autocatalytic effect. So Michael Muthu, Christian, and I have, have created a model of this, a simulation model that shows the conditions under which this process takes off. It's, it's interlinked with the collective brain. Uh, now, arguably, this eventually hits the stops because uh, there's a head size problem, uh, an, obstet an obstetric dilemma problem that heads can only get so big. So this, this creates a puzzle for human evolution. So that's why human babies are so difficult to birth compared to other species. But then, of course, cultural evolution didn't stop. It started making divisions of labor and distributing information across groups. Probably the oldest division of labor is male and female division of labor. But then, of course, eventually we get specialists and all kinds of things. Okay, so this is important for thinking about all kinds of aspects of human psychology uh, 
and anatomy and physiology. So back to the same idea that logic, natural selection shapes our mechanisms for cultural learning, this then produces many of the recurrent features of ancestral environments. So if you're interested in what features that humans recurrently had to face across our evolutionary history as a kind of statistical composite of past environments, many of those were cultural products. So something like fire and cooking is something that humans have probably been using, if you accept my, uh, the arguments from my colleague, Richard Rangham, uh, over a million years old. So for over a million years, possibly longer, uh, we've been, been having, this has been a feature of our environment and this has shaped aspects of our physiology and maybe our interest in fire and our lack of fear of it. Uh, we've been dealing with this growing body of knowledge about plants and animals, and this may explain our folk biological taxonomy, which people like Scott Etran have shown are, are widespread across diverse human societies and seem to explain how children deal with knowledge about plants and animals. The creation of tracking knowledge in water containers may have opened the, the, created the conditions for our running adaptations. So my colleague Dan Lieberman has argued that humans are evolved to run, that we have specializations, anatomical and, and other specializations from, from head to toe, literally, uh, including our nuchal ligaments and our springy arches and our sweating system that only makes sense if we're a running animal. But if you look at humans, it's hard to make us a running animal without tracking techniques in some kind of water container system, because there's a, there's a gap in our physiology in which we don't store water, but we need it desperately to do long distance running. And hunter, we can look at how hunter gatherers solve it and they solve it culturally. So it's as if we have a genetic cultural package that allowed us to do persistence hunting uh, in the way that Lieberman argues. Same thing with tools and artifacts. We seem to have specialized cognition for thinking about artifacts. And first you have to have artifacts in order to get that. So uh, culture drives the process there. I've made the case that humans have two kinds of status, that we have dominant status that we share with other primates, but we also have a prestige status. And it's the uneven distribution of knowledge or skill across the population that one can take advantage of once one is a cultural learner that drives the evolution of prestige-based status. Uh, and then finally, norms and institutions. And once you have reputational systems that incentivize certain kinds of behaviors, uh, that's going to create selection pressures for a norm psychology and things related to pro-sociality. I've, I've made the case that this is the best case we have for a self-domestication process. That we self-domesticated ourselves as we punish norm violators for, for stepping out of line. Okay, so this leads us to the cultural brain hypothesis, which is that the thing that drove the rapid expansion of human brains over the last few million years has been the, the availability of cultural information, all this kind of useful stuff I've been talking about, fire and cooking and knowledge of plants and animals, all the things that Burke and Wills didn't know when they needed to survive in the Australian outback. Uh, and I mentioned that model with Muthu Krishna. This accounts for some of our uh, strange features of our anatomy, our short colons and our small stomachs um, and our nuchal ligaments. Uh, it helps to understand the cognitive differences between species. We saw with Esther Herman's work that this is a complex mosaic, right? Humans aren't immediately out of the gate better on causal thinking or something like that. We only get better as we begin to get that download of pre-solved cultural problems. Um, but we are better on social learning. So we're imitating like crazy coming out of the gate, basically. Uh, it helps us understand things like over imitation and how selection has manipulated our childhoods. So we have these relatively big brains early coming out. And if you notice my picture, my son, Josh, he has a pretty large melon, but a small body. And that means he's ready to learn. He's got to fill up that, that brain, but he's not going to have a lot of caloric demands because he's got a little body until he can get enough information in there. So it helps us understand this. It also potentially helps us understand things like our long post-reproductive period after uh, the cessation of reproduction, so menopause. Here, you, the things that humans can do that other species can't do is grandmothers and grandfathers have large bodies of information which they can bequeath uh, to future generations. And if you look at what declines in the elderly, you know, that, that crystallized intelligence, which is another word for cultural knowledge, uh, is what doesn't decline. It's everything else that's kind of let go over time. Okay, so this is my last slide. Um, so I've made the case that culture is our primary adaptive mechanism and it explains our convergence with other species in terms of responding to ecological constraints. This makes us different from many other species, although more and more we're learning that other species do rely on some culture, although 
in that study uh, by, by Pondorfer and colleagues, um, you know, those were very different species. So we're not seeing the same species uh, ecologically adapting culturally to different environments. It's our primary driver of our genetic evolution. So the cultural brain hypothesis suggested it's what drove the big brains. Um, and then uh, I would make the case that you can't do evolutionary psychology, which I, I think we should do, um, without thinking about how culture has, has been a, a major constructor of the recurrent features of past environments. So we need to think about gene culture, co-evolutionary psychology. All right, that's it. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you very much. That's an incredible story. Um, yeah, and um, we do have uh, questions. Um, and people can vote them up. So I'll just start on top of the list. The first one is about uh, cumulative culture. Is it bounded? Uh, oops. Yeah, a lot of cultural traits uh, replace or mix with previous ones instead of actually accumulating. Well, so the models say that it is bounded, right? So uh, the kinds of models I was talking about when I was talking about the collective brain means that the size and interconnectedness of the population sets a maximum on the complexity of the culture that can be, in the, so the quantity of, of cultural information that can be sustained in the population. Now, of course, one of the things that's happened over the course of cultural evolution is we keep offloading information storage. So now, of course, we can offload into books and we can offload into the internet and we can offload into these places. So we're kind of breaking the boundaries, but we're doing it because we're coming up with cultural fixes to the, to the otherwise uh, cap on the problem. Um, so assuming we can keep coming up with those fixes, uh, it's not clear about the bounds. And certainly a lot of cultural uh, change is not accumulation, but just diversification. So do something differently or create some new recombination and something else disappears. So, I mean, that's gotta be part of the story. Yeah, thanks. Uh, how can we explain non-adaptive cultural practices? Does cultural selection compete with natural selection? Uh, yeah, so that's one of the things that I think is a particularly important and powerful aspect of uh, cultural evolution is that, you know, the, the, idea, the idea has always been that uh, cultural uh, learning produces uh, uh, more adaptive behavior on average, but there's interesting ways in which it can go wildly off course in terms of maximizing genetic or in terms of increasing genetic fitness. So, and this is one of the kind of places where I think there's a fertile uh, interchange between human behavioral ecology and cultural evolution, because, you know, when you see some, when you see a population that's diverted from the predictions of human behavioral ecology, then you can ask the question, well, if we get down to the proximate level and think about the mechanisms, how people are actually learning and how this works, can we explain why you might do something that's extraordinarily maladaptive? So of course, in the, in the modern world, you know, the demographic transition, the, the, the choice of wealthy, educated people to have fewer and fewer babies is a giant maladaptation, at least I would, it seems obvious to me, but others may disagree. But um, I mean, that's a case where there's a number of different ideas about how uh, the currencies that people use in, in social learning can lead to this, this, this maladaptation. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, there's a question about Neanderthals and their unsuccessful story. Uh, so you think it's because of uh, less tuned learning abilities or some uh, hardwired components of uh, complex cognition brains? Yeah, so um, uh, well, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to defer to, the, defer to uh, other experts who might be here, but the case that I make in The Secret of Our Success is that it's possible, it should be a theory on the table to consider the possibility that Neanderthals had less sophisticated technology than the African variants that were coming in and potentially displacing them because they lived in Ice Age Europe and they were scattered in relatively small populations. That's gonna reduce the size of their collective brain and means that they have simpler technologies. And so the process that led to the extermination of the Anderthals is may not be unlike the population that's led to the, that has happened repeatedly over human history as a technologically superior population shows up in a place and there's the technologically inferior population and, you know, they get wiped out, right? And that's a repeated story, and in, in, sadly, in lots of places. Um, so maybe, maybe that's just the story with the Neanderthals. They were just like the Tasmanians or something like that. Uh, what's your favorite definition of culture? 
Well, it's information uh, stored in our brains that got there via some kind of uh, learning process, social learning process. Um, how should we think about language and discourse within a human and cultural evolution framework, particularly with respect to human capacities for cooperation? Mm. So what I tried to do, I did it very briefly uh, as I passed by language there, but I think we should think of language as just a product of the same old uh, cumulative cultural process. Now, like I just said, with things like information storage technology, like books and print, well, printing presses are related to that, uh, computers, whatnot, um, language then gives rise to new things. So once we can accumulate an increasingly sophisticated way of passing information, that opens floodgates for the transmission of more forms of cultural information for higher fidelity forms of cultural transmission, at least in some domains. Uh, and so it increases that. Now, it's a, it's a red herring, I think, to think that, that, the, that language is the key to cooperation because you know, once people start lying, then you should stop listening. And selection will just say, you know, you'll just stop listening to liars and then language goes away. So language has to be true enough in communication uh, that in order to keep it around. So it can solve the basic fundamental problem of human cooperation. It can help people learn norms, but we can transmit norms without any language. So it seems to me it's part of the story and the technology, but it's often portrayed as like, oh, humans get language and cooperation is solved. And there's just no theoretical reason to think that, that that's the case. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, the story of cultural evolution as you presented it, it's uh, mostly about choosing the best and during most of our evolution, basically, we were uh, we knew what is the best in a sense. But now uh, Harari points out that new technologies can know us better than ourselves. How do you think our cultural and genetic evolution will be affected by artificial intelligence, and in particular by companies that control artificial? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're getting out of my area of expertise. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, there's this idea that somehow uh, that now is somehow different than the past. And I feel like, you know, there's always this cultural evolution has been shaping human genetic evolution deep into our evolutionary history. So when we were losing our uh, strong jaws and large teeth, it was because we, were, we had a technological substitute that was, uh, you know, we could, we could have, we had cutting tools and fire and cooking and all these ways to soften the food. And so there's this tendency to think that, well, so, you know, that was actually a maladaptation in some sense because we were getting weaker jaws. We couldn't, we couldn't survive without the cutting tools in the fire. So uh, technologies have been replacing us and, and, and making us somehow less well adapted in some absolute way. But, you know, we're, we're a gene cultural product. So we need our cultural stuff to keep going. And I think things like artificial intelligence will just be like so many other product, cultural products will eventually become part of the package uh, in the same way that fire and cooking are part of the package. Yeah, thanks. Um, there are a couple of questions about social norms. I, I just wanted, I just, I realized there was a question I skipped, which is uh, cultural evolution and genetic evolution going in different directions. So I think in the modern world, you can see that happening clearly where something like um, things that lead to success in your society. So it could be education, uh, wealth, things like that also lead to you having fewer babies. And so selection is gonna pick things that lead to having uh, more babies. So it's gonna select against education. And um, Jonathan Beauchamp has this paper in PNAS showing in the 20th century, there's selection against some of the 74 loci that are associated in these GWAS studies with education. Uh, but those traits are still, greater education is still favored by cultural evolution. So that's a case where genetic and cultural evolution, well, cultural evolution is sprinting and uh, genetic evolution is crawling, but they're crawling and they're going in opposite directions. Yeah, thanks. Um, a couple of questions about so social norms. Um, do we know how they are transmitted uh, for language, uh, observations of actions or condemnations and how also norms are learned and spread in online uh, social networks. Yeah, I don't know anything about the online stuff. I mean, I do know that, you know, you can find experiments with children where you can transmit norms without language, but obviously for some things, uh, you know, language can be super helpful and they can help kids learn the norms faster. They need fewer observations to figure out the norms. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there is uh, one long question. 
uh, social learning, as you suggest, is roughly the ability of a human to learn from and enhance upon the knowledge of past generations. However, it seems that uh, when a given human learns and improves upon the knowledge of the past, they do it as a part of a learning community. Many minds and interactions learning from and improving upon past knowledge. How does your notion of social learning deal with the community of minds in interactions? Yeah, I mean, that's very much how I think of it. So uh, one of the points I, I tried to make earlier was that, you know, in learning this technology, you can take advantage of learning something from one individual and something from another individual and recombining them. Uh, when you layer norms on this, of course, there can be reputational elements and that affect who you're learning from and, and what you're learning or what you'll express. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be shaped by the norms and institutions. I mean, one of the things that I, I focus on in The Weirdest People in the World is how uh, psychology of trusting strangers and individualism can foster more rapid innovation because it means people are sharing more information and they're trying to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, and these things that, that facilitate experimentation and you know, taking a new direction, nonconformity, all these things can help drive innovation. Uh, well, I think a couple more questions and then we'll let you off the hook. Um, do you think that understanding how a human culture has evolved through time help us forge, forge better societies in the future? And if you do, how? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Um, I was, I've been talking about innovation a lot here. So one of, the, one of the insights, I think, that comes out of the collective brain, and I've written a, a, a kind of op-ed that's now posted on uh, This View of Life and also on Evonics, if you're familiar with those sites. And I try to, in that, I summarize ideas from the collective brain, but I apply it to the question of immigration. And I look at a collection of studies that economists have put out in the last three or four years or something. A lot of them are working papers. And you know, there's now census data available. There's the full patent database available. And the story that you get going back to say 1850 or something is that innovation has been a crucial driver of US innovation and ingen uh, uh, ingenuity. So just looking at patent production. Um, and whenever the U.S., so in the, in not, the not early 1920s, the U.S. Uh, had, an, had an explicit campaign to turn down uh, the rate, the flow of immigrants, particularly from uh, Eastern and Southern Europe. And you can just see the innovations drop, the number of patents in fields in which those populations typically had expertise or interest. And so every time the U.S. turns down uh, immigration, it turns down invention. Uh, so that seems relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we have several speakers in this series who are given uh, uh, the status. We can ask questions uh, directly if we want. Um, is there anybody? Uh, Lou, Liz, Marta? No? Yeah, I've just got a... Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi, Joe. Thank you for that lovely talk. Um, I was just wanting to follow up on a previous question, which was, do you think that what language does then is like Brian Skirm says, it helps solve a prior coordination problem rather than cooperation. Is that how you would see it working? Yeah, yeah that's, that's how I see it. I mean, it can, yeah, it can help us figure out what we're gonna do, what we have to do. It might help us figure out who we need to punish, but there's still the cooperative dilemma. And language itself is a cooperative dilemma, right? Because we need to tell yep. the truth at least most of the time. Thanks. Okay. Um, hey, and, I have a question. I yeah. have a question. Hey, Joe, thank you. Thank you as well for the lovely talk. I have a question. Is there a fitness size to the collective brain? Uh, fitness size? Yeah. So I was thinking, so you're talking about the collective brain and how I imagine all ideas of community culture and community resolution and so on. And then we were talking about the Neanderthals going extinct. And I'm so paleo, I have gone straight for the Neanderthals. And then I was thinking, well, to you know all the evidence that's appearing of the Neanderthals, the demography of last Neanderthals being so patchy and broken down, and whether they are losing part of the collective brain and the resilience that way. So I wonder if you have thought, is there a size or an adaptive size for the collective brain? Well, yeah, I mean, uh... I think there's a place at which you could go into a downward spiral. So uh, this is this, this model I mentioned with Michael Muthu Krishna. And there we have a carrying capacity in there. And if you're cultural 
uh, knowledge gets, you know, you can't able to produce enough food given the ecological conditions, then your population starts declining. This kind of happened to the polar Inuit uh, and you can end up in a downward spiral. So for, if folks don't know the polar Inuit case, uh, the, there was a, a European explorer who ended up, we think this is kind of pieced together, but probably transmitted some uh, flu or something to the, to the polar Inuit. They had some die-offs and, and particularly people who had a lot of knowledge about how to make kayaks, which are the main mode of transportation. And that left them essentially marooned in Northern Greenland. <clears throat> and what seems to have happened over the next 50 years or so is they lost a number of valuable technologies. They weren't able to recreate the kayaks. They lost the three pronged spear that they used for fishing. Um, and some other, their snow houses got a little worse until uh, an, another Inuit from a different, from Baffin Island ends up meeting up with them. And they, that reconnects them into the collective brain and they re-get the Baffin Island versions of the technologies they lost, which were different, right? The patents had a slightly different version. So I think that's kind of a case where you had the, the collective brain got broken off and it was too small and it couldn't regenerate itself. Uh, and it was, it was spiraling down demographically. Oh, thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Pete, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, uh, Joe, what do you think of, uh, of the proposals of Cecilia Hayes that, uh, that we often are overestimating the amount of, uh, of innate cognitive adaptations relative to the uh, uh, social learning in, in the construction of, uh, of uh -huh. our cognition? Uh, it seems to me that the evidence for the division of labor between those two things is is pretty weak. We just don't know uh, what the division of labor between social well, learning and, but we do, and we, cognitive. We do have, so uh, what about, lots of chimpanzees uh, have been raised in human environments uh, and they don't seem to get any of the, or not much of the human capacities for imitation and uh, complex cultural cognition that humans get. So if it was just about the constructed environment that Cecilia emphasizes, then shouldn't the chimps get really good? Well, uh, uh, there have to be some innate differences uh, gr granted to, but how much of it is, is innate and how much of it is acquired by uh, social learning is, is the issue, it seems to me. And it seems to no, me that, I, that I don't, I don't agree with some, that. Of the, uh, some of the adaptations uh, may be uh, emotional rather than, uh, than cognitive in the narrow sense of cognition. In other words, Humans take tap into this collective mind that you rightly uh, treat as so important uh, because we're friendly with each other yeah, in a way that uh, that uh, chimps are, are more suspicious of other kind of specifics. For I don't, example, I, I guess I don't agree. I, so selection is always going to do the minimum. It's always going to make the smallest little notches that it can make, and if it can store any information at a lower cost in the environment, it's always going to do that. So. Um, this, so it's kind of like walking. So some animals can step out of the womb and start walking around. You know, humans can't do that. We have to learn to walk. We have to learn lots of things. And that's because selection said, uh, why, waste, why waste energy programming all this in like the village weaver's nest when I can just uh, rely on the environment to provide the relevant structure and I just have to tweak it. But it's just as much an adaptation if the tweaks eventually result in the desired phenotype than if you program all the information in. That doesn't seem to me at all inconsistent with uh, the picture. Fair enough. All right. Well, uh, we have uh, like 25 more questions, but unfortunately, we, I think, uh, should stop now. Uh, uh, all these questions will be uh, on our web page, so everybody will be able to see them, and uh, Joe as well. So, Joe, thank you very much again. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to see you next week when Martha will be giving a talk. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Good to be with you. Good day.